Hello, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming to joining us for another webinar organized by Princeton for everyone worldwide. We're very happy to have Sir Paul Pataka with us today. Hi, Paul. Marcus, good to see you. It's great to have you here. Paul is uh, teaching at the Harvard University at the Kennedy School and is a fellow there and was a central banker for 30 years beforehand and has a lot of expertise on the topic of central bank and financial stability. He will talk about is the UK suffering a sovereign debt crisis? And uh, we will get new insights on this question and given in light of the recent events, what happened to the pound, to the British pound and the interest rate on the guilt, the uh, government bond of the United Kingdom. So let me give a few opening remarks before we jump into Paul's uh, presentation. Um, so in the last few days, what we have seen that the Chancellor of the Exchequer in the UK has uh, announced a mini budget, uh, and that actually involved a lot of tax cuts, uh, not only for people suffering from high energy prices, but also for the wealthy ones. And subsequently, the British pound dropped, and at the same time, the interest rate of the UK government bonds spiked, leading to huge implications, also floating mortgage markets rate. So if somebody has a mortgage, his interest rate will go up too. And in the UK, many of the mortgages are not locked in, they're actually floating. And actually for a time, actually no new mortgages were given because the uncertainty was so high. And that can have huge implications for the housing market uh, in the UK. So the Bank of England reacted uh, based on that. So it initially started tightening given the high inflation everywhere in the world and also in the United Kingdom. Uh, so from tightening and quantitative tightening, it moved essentially in the direction of quantitative easing. So it stepped in as a market maker of last resort uh, in, order, in order to stabilize uh, the guilt market or the long-term bond market. So the question is how do we read that and how should we read that and how do we read it in terms of dominance? As we all know, there's a two dominance uh, concepts, monetary versus fiscal dominance in the uh, fiscal theory of the price level, where the question is who is in charge? Is it the fiscal authorities or the monetary authorities or the central banks? And they play a game of chicken with each other uh, in order to ensure uh, the central bank tries to ensure that uh, prices are stay stable. Of course, you can think of a third dominance uh, concept, the financial dominance, where the central bank is not only hindered to really bring inflation down because of the fiscal authorities not reacting in their spending, but also it might be worried that it might create a monetary tightening, might create some havoc in the financial markets. So the central bank essentially can also be trapped on that dimension. So it cannot do the necessary steps to really bring inflation down because it might be afraid it will actually destabilize financial markets. And that's a financial dominance, which is also uh, worrisome for uh, central bankers. Now, when you look at the recent events, so one way to view this and pension funds played a critical role, it was not traditional uh, banks, it was more the pension funds. Uh, so, and it also involved the so-called LDIs, liability driven investments. And to look at the UK pension, pension funds balance sheet, you have on the asset side, you have a lot of illiquid assets because they were holding illiquid assets gives higher returns than the government bonds. And on the liability sides, of course, they have long lasting liabilities uh, only due in 30 years or whenever people retire. But in 2005, there was a change in the accounting rules in the sense that the liabilities have to be reprised whenever the interest rate is changing. So when the interest rate is actually going up, that means the present value of these liabilities are going down. So there are fewer liabilities in present value terms. So the pension funds made some accounting profits. But of course, when the interest rate goes down, it's the other way around. So they were trying to hedge this accounting profits by going into interest rate swaps. Uh, and these interest rate swaps essentially allow them to hedge these interest rate movements in the liability structure. The difference is that the accounting profits, they don't materialize and they don't generate any cash flows uh, immediately because the cash only has to be paid out when people go uh, for retirement. But the, in, the rest, in the interest rate swaps, they're exchange traded and they're subject to margin calls. So if you make losses, so if you make, for example, if the interest rate spikes, you make accounting profits, you don't get any cash flowing in. But from your interest rate swaps, you immediately have to make margin calls. You need some cash to pay your margin calls. And that actually caused some shortage of this cash because 
the illiquid assets you couldn't use for margins to pay up your margins. And that actually led to a shortage of, um, of this uh, cash. And it also destabilized the interest rate swap market and also led uh, to a huge spike in, um, in the guild market. So the interest rate went up uh, significantly. So all of this was done via liability-driven investments. And it's, it's a huge sums involved. So 1.5 trillion are uh, roughly in LDIs. So this essentially, you can see this as, you know, as a way where you look at the interest rate swap. So in 2005, this accounting rules were changed. And since then, you know, pension funds try to hedge this in particular, this accounting risk with some interest rate swaps. And you see how essentially you see an explosion of interest rate swap market compared to other uh, interest rate uh, products, the interest rate swap market is the big one. And once you have the margin calls coming in, you have a so-called margin spiral kicking in. So you have tighter margins. Because of the tighter margins, you have to fire sell off some of your illiquid, illiquid assets. You also have to, you know, uh, cover your, your margins. And then this drives up volatility of the price even further because higher volatility leads to even higher margins. You have this margin spiral kicking in. And the question is, you know, nobody else wanted to step in and sell uh, and buy uh, US, UK treasuries or UK guilds. And that's also is some predatory behavior going on as well. So you have this amplification going on through the margins uh, in, in this setting. So the big question essentially is you can have, interpret the, the current events in the UK in three different ways, and they have very different implications what the world will look like going forward. So one a negative interpretation is that actually the UK mini budget actually was a signal and the market interpreted as a signal that the UK will have much larger debt levels going forward and there will be fiscal dominance. So in this sense, there will be no way to rein in the fiscal expenditures and raising taxes in order to get the primary surplus going. And this will imply higher inflation that got scared because of that, because it provides a long-term signal this way. An alternative interpretation, which is very different, that's what I outlined just a minute ago, is it's more a financial stability issue. And because the hedging done by these pension funds for accounting reasons, on the one hand, the accounting profits don't materialize, but the losses on the uh, in, in interest swap market materialize right away. There are tensions there. And that because of that, because of margin spiral is amplified and the Bank of England stepped in as a temporary market maker of last resort. And the question is, you know, will this lead to financial dominance, as I mentioned initially, where the central bank has to step in, even though it would like to tighten at the moment when inflation is very high. The third interpretation is essentially that UK is vulnerable, has a large current account deficit and so forth. And the second story was just a trigger, and that will spill over into a larger crisis, including potential crisis, which involves uh, the first story. So it's essentially a combination of the two. So the second thing is, if it's not handled well, it will just trigger a bigger crisis as mortgage market freeze, as the mortgage rates go up, and as the credibility and reputation uh, is lost. And we're trying to figure out, you know, which of the stories are the more reasonable ones and what to do in order to avoid the spillovers, even if their trigger is, is triggered now, you minimize the spillovers. And that's uh, what we're trying to understand. So let me conclude with a few poll questions. And that's the questions uh, Paul put forward. And uh, here are the answers you gave us. And thanks a lot for participating always very nicely with the polls. So is the UK slipping towards a sovereign debt crisis? Yes or no? And the answer is 41% said yes and 59% said no. So the majority is clearly saying it's not uh, going out, but there's a serious concern here uh, as well. The second question is, can the UK get sustainable growth up to two and two and a half percent over the next five to 10 years? So that was one of the uh, hopes with the new budget. Will it get this growth only 70 37% thought yes, 63% said no. The third question was, is the financial turbulence in the UK markets likely to spill over to other markets? And for that, um, it's 64% it will spill over, 36% thought it will not spill over. And finally, is this episode, you know, which involves these pension funds and other shadow banks and the interest rate swap market, is it as serious as it was in 2007? Yes or no? 
And actually 58% thought it's as serious as it was in 2007. So that will lead quite to some uh, pro uh, problems. And 42% thought it's not as serious as in 2007. So Paul, with this, I leave you with these answers and their first impressions of our audience. Uh, and I hope you will enlighten us um, with further thoughts. Thanks again for doing us and uh, looking forward to your presentation. Well, well, thank you very much for inviting me, Marcus. And it's been, it's been light relief for me, if that doesn't sound frivolous, to spend time on, on this rather than preparing to market my new book, Global um, Discord. Um, can we, M Marcus is gonna control the slides um, for me. Can we just look quickly at the first two? Um, oh, one sec. Okay. Nearly tell everybody something they already know. This is, that's the Bank of England's policy rate since 1997 when Bank of England was made independent. And you see a long period after the financial crisis where policy rate is very close to, to zero, gets down as low as 0.1%. And then recently it's risen to, in small steps, I would say curiously small steps, to around um, 2%. Let's see the next chart. That's, this is the pattern of quantitative easing, the stock of gilt purchases since they began at the beginning of um, 2009. And that there are, there are um, three, four phases to this really. The first, which was quantitative easing in response to the um, world financial crisis where the stock goes up to about 200 um, billion. And then it increases a bit during the Euro area crisis in 2011, 12. Looking back, I think that's an incredibly important moment um, in terms of monetary and fiscal strategy. There is a, a, an increase in mid 2016. I, I, had re I had left office by then and I moved to Harvard at the end of 2013. There is a, a chunk of, of quantitative easing in mid 2016 in response to, in response to the um, Brexit referendum. Personally, I think that should have been a market maker of last resort operation rather than permanent QE. And then as you'll see from 2020, there is a very big um, increase um, during COVID. I mean, on a different scale from that required in 2009 to help the economy recover. And I most definitely think that should have been initially temporary market maker of last resort with debt financed um, fiscal policy. And we, we might come on to why that matters. Let, let's move on briefly to the next um, chart. So th this is showing forward rates, nominal forward rates for 10, 20 and 30 year um, sterling interest rates. And the, the key point here is merely that over the past fortnight or so, they have been very volatile, sharply rising after the fiscal um, event of the new government, and then coming down um, somewhat. And what, what I'm going to go on to do, um, that's just all by way of background, is I'm initially going to go through a thought process that I had last Monday, in the light of comments over the weekend and on last Monday morning, that the UK was, was slipping into a sovereign debt crisis. And the answers that you gave to the first question where roughly 40%, 40% thought that the UK may be slipping towards a sovereign debt crisis are to me incredibly interesting. And you'll see why I think that the financial market data, so far at least, doesn't support that. And um, I kind of gave a version of this to the class that Larry Summers and I teach to fourth and third year um, undergrads. It's a small course on research on macro policy last Thursday. And I was talking to Marcus about this and he said, why don't you present it? So let's, let's go on to the next slide. This is the first important slide, this next one. Hold on one sec. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So don't, don't look at the slide quite yet. Um, just, just let me make a completely obvious point. So, Setting aside all the things said about the UK budget in terms of marginalizing various UK institutions and not saying anything about the future fiscal framework, but merely concentrating on the fact that there was plainly um, a stimulus to aggregate demand over the short run, 
um, because they announced tax cuts and various other things that were quite sizable um, in aggregate. And so what other things being equal would one expect in those circumstances? Well, one would expect the short part of the yield curve to move up because one would expect there to need to be a monetary policy tightening to offset the stimulus to a positive shock to aggregate demand coming from fiscal policy and other things being equal, one would expect sterling's exchange rate to rise. That's absolutely kind of standard um, stuff. But that's not quite, quite what happened. If one looks at the left-hand chart, you'll see that indeed the short end of the um, sterling yield curve did move up quite sharply, completely consistent with expectations of the path of the Bank of England's policy rate having moved up. But if you look at the long, uh, the right-hand chart, you'll see that the, the, um, the term structure moved up absolutely across the yield curve to kind of 20 years, 30 years um, and beyond. And of course, that isn't what one expect at all. One would expect, if it was purely um, a temporary shock to aggregate demand, one would expect a temporary um, increase in the policy rate and then it would fall back to whatever towards neutral path it's going to be um, on. And at the same time, I don't need to show you this chart yet, sterling fell. So instead, rather than the standard story, what we had was a shift up in long forward rates and a fall in sterling. So then one asks oneself, um, what could bring that about? And one possible explanation, the one that gripped commentary was, well, that's what would happen um, if there were doubts about the UK's sovereign credit worthiness um, over, the, over the long, medium to, to long run, because a risk premium um, would creep into the sterling yield curve and into the sterling um, exchange rate. And, and, and that was, I think, quite sensibly, the kind of commentary that existed over the, over, over the weekend following the a fiscal event. But then one has to ask the question, okay, say that's true, and this is the central point of the presentation, say that were to be true, that there is now a, a, a tangible probability, not, not very high necessarily, but a tangible probability that the UK will default um, in some way, in some way of important words, over the short, medium to long run and a risk premium is being charged. So then one has to ask the question, well, if that's completely true, how would the UK um, default on its sovereign bonds over whatever period? And of course, cutting through some complexities, there are basically two ways of doing that. One is to legally default. At some point, the Treasury would stop, up, stop sending out um, coupons and stop repaying um, principal. Or alternatively, um, it could monetize the debt or seek to inflate away the real value of the debt, which of course is an economic default rather than a, a legal default. And the thing about the UK compared to some other countries is that um, it has its own central bank. It isn't part of a broader monetary system. And therefore, um, to put it mildly, one would expect a non-zero probability um, being attributed by the market to the, to the prospect of the UK inflating away its, its, its debt. And therefore, that either infl medium term inflation expectations would move up, or, or alternatively, that an inflation risk premium would creep into nominal bonds, of course, not real bonds, um, or both. Can we go on to the next chart, um, please, Marcus? This is the key chart. So the, as everybody watching knows, um, big picture, the difference between um, nominal bond yields and real bond yields or nominal forward rates and real forward rates, which of course are derived by modeling um, curves, gives you a measure of in the first case, um, break even inflation over the maturity one's looking at or, of, or a, an estimate markets views of expected forward inflation, both, both in both cases, incorporating a risk premium, which is a real thing, as well as um, expected inflation. And the thing is, um, inflation expectations didn't move at all 
in the wake of the, um, um, the fiscal event. It, th there's some volatility where you'll see inflation expectations come down and then go back up, but actually there, that's after the Bank of England's intervention in the market, which I'll come on to in a second, but actually there's no movement in, um, in inflation expectations at all. I'm showing 10 years here, but it's true at all, every other um, important um, maturity. So That's then what I would say, That's what this has to mean is that if the market thinks that there is now a tangible risk of some kind of default, the market thinks that conditional on that event occurring, it's almost 100% likely that that would come in the form of legal default, the treasury ceasing to um, pay coupons and repay principal. And I just put it to you, and this was the view I formed, that that is utterly um, implausible. And therefore, by Monday, I was thinking, it's very interesting that people are talking about a prospect of sovereign default. Um, you'd expect that to turn up in um, break-even inflation uh, measures, and it isn't doing so at all. Maybe there's something else going on at the long end. Marcus, I think you wanted to intervene. Yeah, I wanted to ask you because Daryl Duffy was asking, it might be that the liquidity premium went up uh, for these bonds because the bid ask spreads widened. Uh, I, perhaps you will allude to this anyway. No, no, quite so, quite so. I mean, hi, Daryl. Um, all I'm trying to do at this stage, Daryl, Marcus, everybody else, is, is, is test a kind of fundamentals proposition. My goodness, they've junked fiscal rectitude a default premium is creeping into the uh, market. Um, Tucker asserts that there should be a positive probability on that default coming through an economic default through higher inflation reflected in an inflation um, risk premium. In fact, for what it's worth, my subjective view is that were there to be a default in a country like the UK, it's almost 100% likely that it would come through higher um, inflation rather than through a legal default. And I'm going to say slightly sweepingly, that doesn't turn up in um, breaking even inflation at the beginning of the week um, or since. And that leans against the fundamental story. Could there be something else um, going on, which I think is the kind of story that Daryl is alluding to. And the point I think, Daryl, is say you're completely right. Well, that's a very different kind of story from, oh, my goodness, the UK is is heading um, into a, a into a story of of um, deep fiscal problems and the possibility of default. And then, of course, when one before going on to the next slide, when one one has that thought, and the, the underlying theme is run with the hypothesis and then test it. And so we now have a hypothesis that seems, oh, perhaps actually it isn't a sovereign default. Well, might there be a? Uh, does that fit with other things? Well, it might fit, for example. Um, with the possibility that there is going to be a general election in the UK over the past um, few years. And therefore, whatever the rights or wrongs, magnificences or weaknesses of the current government's fiscal um, policy, perhaps it isn't certain that that fiscal policy will last into the um, medium run. So I think that a lot of the, I'm going to put my neck out a bit, I thought that by last Monday, I concluded that a lot of the, the, the commentary was, 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 how should I put it, perhaps not checking the most obvious diagnostic of whether the, the, the broadcast story um, was fully robust. Can we go on to the next well, slide, please? Jeffrey oh, Garnier, he would like to know about, probably we'll talk about credit default swaps as well for the UK. Did you we were right at the end. I think this is the, a great point, and I think there is a puzzle about about that and perhaps i should say at this stage um that another story is that actually although we have to kind of update our view each day actually i personally don't but those with responsibilities um have to um one shouldn't place great weight on any story from day to day um because actually markets can take time to digest news and bring themselves into relative equilibrium um, through the arbitrage um, process. And we'll see it right at the end that there's either a puzzle at the moment in terms of the fundamentals or alternatively um, that the market arbitrage process um, is not yet complete. Can we go on to the next one, please, uh, Marcus? 
Um, I think we can skip that one actually. And we can, that, that's just showing you the same story, which is that not only did 10 year inflation um, forwards not move, um, 30 year inflation forwards um, didn't move um, either. Next one, please. So this is a, a chart included in um, a letter which one of the current policymakers at the Bank of England sent to the UK Parliament yesterday or today. And it's, it's, it's quite a nice chart for summing up what has been kind of obvious at at least the level of kind of crude phenomena over the past week, which is a look at the, the turquoise line, which is the 30 year um, gilt yield, the kind of par yield. It's not a forward rate, I don't think. And that, that there was a, an MPC meeting just before the fiscal event. And I think the Bank of England increased by its policy rate by 50 basis points. And there was some criticism around the place that that wasn't quite enough. And um, possibly that was creeping into gilt yields afterwards, or possibly people were anticipating um, the subsequent fiscal event, because as is the nature of these things in the UK, there was a lot of talk about what would be in the, um, in the budget before the budget was actually presented to Parliament. And then the fiscal event takes place and gilt yields shoot up. And then I was talking about my mental processes on the Monday, and then on the Tuesday, the Bank of England announced that it was going to conduct what Mark has called a market maker of last resort. I think those are exactly the right words. It's what I would call a market maker of last resort operation. The Bank of England, um, I think regrettably, and to its, slightly to its own cost, has not used um, that language, which we could come back to if you wish. But anyway, the, 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 the impact, at least for the moment, of offering to buy bonds at long maturities um, of up to around 65 billion over a fortnight, but in fact they've bought a tiny fraction um, of that has been to bring long yield yields and as we'll see long forwards down um, um, a lot. I think by the way, as an aside, it should be no surprise whatsoever that they haven't had to buy very many. I've seen some commentary from the market that says uh, this, they're not buying anything like the necessary amount. It's worth remembering that in 2000 and was it 2011 or 2012, Mario Draghi didn't actually buy anything when he did the market maker of last resort operation in the Euro area. And at a more modest scale in 2009, when Mervyn King, Charlie Bean and I and Paul Fisher did a market maker of last resort operation in the sterling corporate bond markets, we bought a few hundred million, as I recall, and it, and it, it cured the problem in the, um, in the sterling corporate bond market. So it's not surprising that they haven't bought many. Of course, we don't know what will happen when they, when they stop um, buying. One never, one never um, does in advance. But this is this According is, to some this, this is suggestive. This is suggestive that the story at the long end is a frictional um, story, the kind of LDI story that Mark has told, and not something about a shock to um, the probability of a sovereign default. I'm sorry, Marcus. I'm, I'm just saying some sources say that the Bank of England hasn't bought any guilds in the last two days, uh, just to Good for them. What you're Good for them. The key thing about being a market maker of last resort, I gave a speech about this in 2009, um, after we'd done the sterling corporate bond thing, um, that if you just stand there and make it clear that you are ready to be a, a purchaser, um, that can sometimes be enough to, to bring, bring bid offer spreads back in and bring market makers back into the market, which is what happened um, then. So I think the commentary that picks on how little there has been, um, is, is not much commentary doing that, but there's been some, I think it's utterly misplaced. I think the fact that they haven't had um, by much um, so far is corroborative of the friction story ra rather than of the fundamentals. Um, when you talk about market maker of last resort, do you have in mind that primarily you're trying to bring bid ask spreads down and become making the market liquid again? You know, everything will normalize on its own. Or is it you want to bring the rates, you want to change the, the, what's your objective primarily? It's not the second. 
it's not the second. I mean, I, I, I've written about this a bit. In fact, there's even a, um, a passage on this in my previous book on elective power. Um, as I envisaged it in 2009, and this is not exhaustive, there are two sets of circumstances in which one might want to be an actor, market maker of last resort. The first is um, the market, uh, market participants have become, um, performed the view that a particular instrument is unsound and actually they're wrong. And it's become a self-fulfilling view that no one dare lead um, against. A, a, an alternative um, um, motivation, and this was the motivation in 2009, is what you get a kind of market maker run for the exits where um, in adverse market circumstances, um, dealers want to contain their inventory um, risk. One way of containing inventory risk is to use the language of the 1980s, um, to put, not answer the telephones in the dealing room. Um, if there are any two market makers, of course there are more, but if there are any two market makers and I know the other one is no longer answering the telephone, it, mm. then all of the inventory risk now lies with me. So I'd probably stop answering the telephone as well. And you can think of this as a kind of a world in which the bid offer spreads um, explode and what the market maker of last resort does, and this is, what I'm going to give is an analog to the lender of last resort idea of a penalty rate, is you come in with implicitly um, a bid offer spread that is much narrower than the one actually prevailing in the market, which may be infinite, um, but somewhat wider than the ones that would, the bid offer spread that would prevail in completely ordinary um, conditions, which you do, of course, to protect yourself from. Um, risk. You're trying to, to undo a market friction and bring the other market makers, the private sector market makers, back into the market. And when we did this in the sterling bond market in 2009, that is exactly what happened. And actually, there was record sterling corporate bond um, issuance by a record number of issuers during 2009. And, and nine. I think but it has been a, a, as a sweeping In terms of communication, aside. would you then announce Sorry? a particular, would, in terms of communication, would you announce a particular target for the bid? No, no you, no, you don't. You do actually pretty much what the Bank of England has done, but with one difference. First of all, you use the words market maker for last resort, um, which we didn't in 2009, but I think we would have done by the middle of 2009 when we um, had had time to kind of reflect um, more, but no, you have a you have a reserve price which you don't publish. But you're not you're not targeting a level of yields or prices. You're trying to let the market function, and 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 of course, I've told I've, I'm presented so far as though this is an either or. There's either a fundamental shock, or there's a friction shock. But of course, it could be both. And what you want what you want is the the market to work well enough um, to discount the news of any. Um, putative fundamental shock um, without um, mispricing it because of a drying up of liquidity. Can we go on? Can, to can I push you a little bit harder in a sense that uh, there are two alternative perspectives. So one is to could say, yes, I agree this was a friction shock or some liquidity issue in the markets, but it was there's an underlying vulnerability already there. And this was just triggering then the vulnerability and then things got worse. Or you could also make the case, if you have these events regularly, you also undermine the reputation and the credibility of the bond market. And it might, you might have to pay dearly in the long run for that. So there are two things here, um, one of which we can probably see if we go on to the next slide. Um, Try to remember what the next slide is. I'll discover in a moment. Okay, let me say something about that in a moment. The second point you make is, might you just be um, um, disguising underlying fundamental problems, not in the sense of fundamental macroeconomics, but fundamental problems in the mic um, microstructure of a particular market? Yes. Um, but you can't fix problems in the microstructure of the market or in the, um, the balance sheets of important market participants in a day. 
Um, and so like, just like a lender of last resort operation, mostly, not always, not in the case of an absolutely pure panic, but mostly uh, a lender of last resort operation buys you time to fix underlying problems. And so here, the policymakers will have to face the question um, of, is there a problem with the functioning of the gilt market? There plainly is a problem with the functioning of the US Treasury market. And that, in my view, that has been for about over 20 years. Um, and, and, and separately, um, in this particular episode, is, is there a problem um, with parts of the pension fund sector being over levered and illiquid. And let me, in case we don't come on to this, let me say something now about this LDI um, thing, which is that most of the commentary I have seen has been, um, well, they've done this LDI and therefore they're very livid and very illiquid. Those are plainly true propositions. But the, the thing that I haven't um, seen, maybe it exists, um, policymakers certainly need it and should have had it already, is, okay, people are using these structures. And actually there are two which we need to dwell on. They amount to the same thing. One is I own cash guilds and I repo out the cash guilds and I use that cash to invest in high yielding, but more or less liquid um, assets. The other one is that I um, take my guilt exposure on the asset side via a derivative, via a swap, and therefore I've still got the cash. It, may, it, makes, it makes no difference. But the questions you'd want to know and the questions they should now find out if they don't know already are um, how much of the portfolio had been levered up in this way, 100%, 90%, um, 10%. Um, the, the less the portfolios were levered up, um, the more other things being equal that would make one worry about um, a guilt market microstructure problem um, as well. The more they are levered up, given their size, they're 99% levered or 100% um, levered, the more one would think that other things be equal. Couldn't rule out a guilt market microstructure problem, but you'd be thinking that this is more a problem of what I'm going to casually call um, shadow banking. That's the first thing you'd want to know. The second thing you'd want to know is in repoing out the gilts or entering into the um, swaps, what were the margin requirements on that? Um, I mean, it is, it, is, it is going to be impossible to anyone in the private sector or, or in the authorities to argue that a lesson of 2007 was not that you should keep track of those things all of the time. And the third thing um, would be you actually need to know something about, okay, they bought these high yielding liquid bonds. What were they? Which could range from power stations and oil tankers. So I'm thinking back to the mid zeros, which are really pretty liquid indeed, to, to corporate bonds of, of high quality, which shouldn't be that illiquid. Um, and then the question is, um, and this, this, it's important for the policymaker to separate how worried am I about the gilt market? How worried am I about these LDI funds? Because an alternative course of action, I'm not saying better, was to do a lender of last resort operation via the banks, where the Bank of England would lend against the illiquid assets at, I don't know, some big haircut, 30%, 40%. While I'm talking to Mervyn about this, I, I joke that, and I would have, I can remember meetings where I would say 30% haircut and you'd say 40, and Mervyn said, and we'd settle at 35. And that's, uh, but that, you know, you have, to, you have to do some serious work behind those numbers. You can't just make them up. Um, but you know, those would be circumstances where the banks would lend to the LDI vehicles and the Bank of England would lend to the um, banks against the underlying but assets. Would you and you need to know what those underlying assets are. So, but would you go so far that actually, you know, the original problem was the accounting rule that, you know, the liabilities are marked to market or the interest rate movements changed the revaluation of the liability side. And the way you manage this interest rate risk is 
is not the right way or do, would, one way would be a radical approach would be let's not manage this interest rate risk at all because these are long lasting pension funds they're not subject to runs and they're not like banks so i tend to think i tend to think and remember i do different things these days um i tend to think that this is a red herring in terms of the analysis that if one has um long fixed liabilities um, and assuming the sponsor of the scheme is low risk, I'm going to give an example in a minute. Um, well, then you want to buy um, broadly matching um, long duration government bonds. And the UK has a practice of issuing um, long duration government bonds, which partly goes at, back actually to some work that John Cunliffe, who's currently at the bank, and I did when I was the UK debt manager in the middle of the 1990s. And I think that's been a good thing. Um, and actually, the Bank of England Pension Fund did that while Mervyn was governor and Charlie and I were the um, deputy governors. And we, we increased the contribution rate into the fund. Uh, in fact, you, if we gave up the yield pickup, we had an interest rate uh, match, and we introduced the contributions. And the, the, the problem with these hedge funds is <laughs> LDI schemes. It's not up fundamentally the accounting thing, it's that they levered up and took um, maturity mismatches. And um, this isn't new. I mean, it's, it's been, everyone has always known, and I got around to saying this in a speech in 2012, that if you hold a portfolio of, of um, essentially default free government bonds, you can build your own bank. Or as one of my former advisors put it to me, you can roll your own bank like rolling a cigarette. You repo out your government bonds um, and uh, on demand, and you and you then invest them in a credit portfolio or an even more risky um, portfolio. And lo and behold, you've got um, you've got two things working on going on, of which the most important is long-term liabilities and a risky asset portfolio. So I agree with you that if you want to make the pension system very sound, uh, I think that should be done. But there's also an argument to be made that you know, in, in general, the, the risk premium are way too high and people don't want to invest in risky assets. Nobody wants to invest in risky assets. Everybody wants to hold government bonds and hence it stifles real investment. So from a macro perspective, we want some institutions to provide some risky funding in a sense, or do we want to push them always out of risky funding? In less so this funding? gets to a deeper issue, which we might come back to um, at the end, which is if you, th these, are, this, these are considerations that bear on a higher level question about the mix of monetary policy and fiscal policy, um, um, taking account of all the things that bear on social welfare over time in a political society. And it is a consideration to be weighed alongside others, but it's a consideration where you would say, actually, you, you want to rely less in response to a kind of slump of the kind we've had over the past decade or so on monetary stimulus, and in particular, less on quantitative easing, and more on debt-financed um, fiscal stimulus, because um, then you won't be removing safe assets from the marketplace. Now, of course, this bears on the deep and big question of is the, is the equilibrium real interest rate low because of an ex-ante excess of savings over investment, or which I think of as partly a Harvard story, um, partly because of Larry's um, papers with Rachel Lukash, um, or, or is it, um, a shortage of safe assets um, story, which I think of as an MIT um, story. And of course, both could be true. And one, one diagnostic is we'll have spreads between risk-free assets and riskier assets. Um, so let me come back to your main widen, widen or that, not. that uh, you know, you're saying that it is more a frictional story, a liquidity story, rather than a solvency a problem for the United Kingdom. So the question is, 
how do you explain then the movement of the pound, so the exchange rate? How does this square? In okay, let me, so let me go back to the slideshow. First, first of all, to be more precise about what I'm saying is I'm, I'm not quite saying there is no solvency problem. I'm saying that if one went through the diagnostics at the beginning of last week and since, you don't find a solvency problem in the place where you would most expect to find it, given that the UK is a country that um, where the government could order monetization. So then the Bank of England does its um, operation. And what this show chart shows on the left side, the short part of the OIS forward curve on the um, right hand side, the whole curve. And what you see is, is the blue line is the pre-fiscal event and the orange line is life immediately after the fiscal event. And the, um, and the green line is what happens um, after the Bank of England's um, intervention. And what's interesting about that, but we're going to see something even more interesting in a moment, is on the whole the green curve um, moves down, certainly at the short end, um, but not so much at the very um, long end. Can we, can we move on to the next um, chart? But here are guilt um, forwards now. That was OIS. And implicit in what I've said about OIS curves, I'm, I am assuming, which may not be true, I'm in no position to check, that the collateralization of long dated forward contracts in OIS um, is adequate. But here we see something else when we look at the guilt forward structure. And this matters because this is the market in which the government actually funds. This is not about expectations of the path of the monetary policy rate. This is where the government finance itself. Just look at the right hand car, um, um, chart. There you see there's a kind of peculiar hump which suggests that the arbitrage process isn't over yet. But at the long end, um, the forwards have come um, down since the um, 9th of of September, um, not, not moved up. And could you go on to the next one, please? So I'm still missing the punchline. And this, well, we, this, the, the punchline actually is the importance of, of looking at all the diagnostics rather than leaping to conclusions. That's the punchline okay, for people sitting out there. The punchline is don't declare the world's ending. When you, if you check something, you'll find that maybe it's not. That's the punchline. Okay. Um, the, and there, there won't be a definitive view on what's happening. So this is the, the, the guilt forward OIS spread. You could take this to be a proxy for term premium. And this is quite interesting that to the point where I wonder whether the charts are mislabeled almost in that it would seem that the um, term premium have come down. And the reason that this matters is because an alternative story for an increase in forward rates at the long end would be, this is nothing to do with sovereign risk um, for the reasons I've already given in inflation break evens, but there is a massive increase in supply that is gonna last for some years. And maybe even the United Kingdom with its um, vast appetite from pension funds and life companies, from um, guilt companies, guilt, guilts, um, Actually, there's going to be a, a, a you'd expect there to be a, a larger, either a, a less negative um, term premium or a more positive term premium at the long end. And to my surprise, that seems to be not the case so far. Can we go on to the next one? So I want to do the exchange rate before we end. Um, we, can, we can skip that one, that's just changes. Um, this is what happened to the exchange rate. Um, fiscal event occurs and sterling falls pretty sharply against the dollar, but it also more significantly falls against the, the euros. The point being that that's not entirely um, a dollar story, um, as some of the newspapers or commentators were suggesting. And then after the Bank of England does its market maker last resort operation, um, sterling's exchange rate comes back somewhat, and then go on to the next one. Um, this is the exchange rate um, index, and you'll see there that 
um, there's actually hardly been a change um, relative to the last few years. And then I think we do two more charts. You can skip a couple, skip that one, skip that one onto the next. But this is the five year credit default swap rate, which moved up from um, around 10 basis points to a, the, the, ignore the vertical axis, it moved um, up from about 10 basis points to about um, 40 basis points, and it hasn't um, come back down since the, um, since the market disturbances. So where I think we are now, actually, is I think we should be agnostic. I think we should, on the information we have available to us, I think we should not think that this is a shock to perceptions of a sovereign default. So my answer to the first question you posed, Marcus, would be no rather than yes, and I hope all the yes answers, um, because I'm a British citizen, I hope you lose money on your, on your trade or on your view. Um, but of course, we can't be sure that there isn't something going on. There, there plainly is a big increase in um, the supply of gilts relative to prospective demand. One would expect that to turn up in an increased term premium, not obvious it has done so yet. And the credit default swap um, rate, and really would one want, one would want a term structure for this, but I'm not in a position to, to get one. That one would cause one to pause and say, we should still be um, cautious about what's going on. And certainly the events of the last week do nothing other than reinforce the absolute necessity of governments at all times carefully articulating what their fiscal framework is, carefully um, articulating and underlining their commitment to sound public finances over the medium um, to long run. And this is just like any business, or for that matter, hedge fund, which is however great the ideas are of from supply side economics in, in, this, in this case, you, you, you need to be able to fund your plan. And, and for the UK, which already starts out with a high level of debt after the financial crisis, after COVID, after the war's energy price shocks, um, that is doubly important. There can be no complacency at all. Um, you, the government needs to be much clearer about its fiscal framework. The Bank of England needs to be much more um, um, determined about bringing down um, um, domestically generated inflation. It needs to be in less denial that there is domestically generated inflation. But no, on the diagnostics we have so far, there is not evidence, I would suggest, um, of expectations of sovereign default. Because anyone that wanted this position in the credit default swap market would probably also be taking a, um, an inflation bet in the government bond So market. can I make a provocative uh, point in a sense that if you look at fiscal versus monetary authority, would it be over the top to argue, or perhaps it was in the favor of the Bank of England to let the yield explode because the fiscal authorities backtracked on their fiscal plans. So the mini budget, the tax cut was removed for the high earners. And this way it was essentially in favor of monetary dominance rather than fiscal dominance. So it, and they used essentially the LDI and the explosion of the yield curve to, to push the fiscal authorities in a corner. This, is a one, this isn't a one-shot game. This is a repeat game. Um, between um, involving the authorities. And it's, it's one where um, each generation of policymakers bequeaths something to its, its successors and on forever. That would be such a reckless thing um, to do. If people in the treasury or the labor opposition today, or people who might form the leadership of the Tory party in five years time or 10 years time, were to think that the Bank of England had done that once in order to bring a government to ransom, um, that would be um, very bad for the Bank of England. I'm making a point entirely in terms of institutional self-interest. It would also, of course, be a disgrace, um, which is a kind of normative point about the political values that we live by in electoral democracies. So I'd, I'd, be, I'd be surprised if they'd been silly enough to do, to do that. And Another point I would like to raise, do you disagree with Larry Summers? I mean, he just published today in the FT, it's an interview with Martin Wolf. Um, do you have a different perspective? Because it seems like Larry is much more saying that it was not only uh, 
financial fiction story. It's much more fundamental, uh, sovereign story. I think so uh, far he's wrong. Pardon? You think he's I think wrong? So far he is. He looks wrong, oh. and 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 I am somebody who some of the people watching will know has absolutely been of the same view as Larry about inflation since 2021. Indeed, thinks since 2000 and. And 20, and let me say, I mean, he's my friend, he's someone I teach with. I think the way he was dumped on at the beginning of 2021 um, was rather shameful. But so far, I don't um, um, agree with him about this. And we've, we've had some really good discussions about it. Okay. And the fact that the IMF was essentially became very critical of the mini budget, do you think that was? Well, I think there are two things to say about the IMF. Um, it's there's, there's first of all, were they right to make a statement at all? Um, and secondly, and I've got clearer views on the second, if they did make a statement, did they make the right statement? No, they made a, ve they made a very poor statement that I think bordered on incompetent, um, frankly. Um, it said two things. Um, first of all, you should reverse what you've done because of inequality. Well, this is reminiscent of them going into Indonesia and, and telling them how to structure their economy. Whatever my personal views um, and, and that of other British policymakers on, on the particular fiscal package and its, its effects on inequality, um, we, we're a democracy, we're still a reasonably healthy democracy and we will have an election that will put that kind of thing to the test. And it's frankly, none of their business. Um, and the reason it matters that it's none of their business is that they need to, to, to use their resources and you know huge human capital on what is their business. So they then said something about monetary policy will need to be tighter over the short run. Well, blow me over. What an absolutely extraordinary thing. What they didn't say was what they should have said, which is, um, it's tremendously important that the new government articulates its fiscal framework. We welcome that um, um, the finance minister has indicated that he will articulate the fiscal framework quite soon. We look forward to seeing that very much. So there was a, there were, there was a big sin of commission. There was something that didn't amount to a row of beans and there was a big sin of omission, which actually on the whole, um, suggests that it's a good idea to think about what you've got to say before you make a statement. When one's in office, when one isn't in office, it's completely the other way around, of course. One can speculate. Uh, well, I think, I mean, this is something Larry, Larry and I have talked about. I think when one's out, not in office, when that's behind one, I think one is trying to kind of do small things to enrich debate, be a bit provocative. Um, get people to think about things. It's quite different when one actually has the responsibility. So going forward, so uh, besides of outlining a, a clearer framework on the fiscal side, but also on the monetary side, what other measures do you see or what are you looking out for saying, okay, which confirms this view or the other view? Is there something where say we should really look at this indicator or you know, what, what would we look at? Yes, I think there is actually. And I think it's more in terms of policy action rather than, than market um, 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 prices. It's, it's what are they gonna do about this buildup of, of leverage and liquidity mismatches in the non-bank um, financial mm -hmm. um, sector. So at one level, this is not a surprise. Um, many of those of us who were involved in the policy reforms after 2009 or from 2009 onwards said, um, it won't be enough just to strengthen the core banking system because that will create incentives to move things out of um, de jure banking into de facto banking. That's an old story that goes back years. But then of course, further than that, the, the Stachelberg game that led to a complete reliance on monetary policy after, after the initial phase of 2009-10 the Stachelberg game is one where the fiscal policymaker chooses not to move in the knowledge that the monetary policymaker must do more. And partly because of the zero low bound, um, that meant um, intervening more and more in government bond markets and pulling down term premia and compressing volatility, all of the things that are conducive to um, a search for yield. And I'm deliberately using the language search for yield because that was the language, of course, that 
many people, including my old, one of my old teams, used in the run-up to 2007. And concretely, what some of us would like to, not just in the UK, elsewhere as well, what some of us would like to have seen from 2015, 16, would be if, if when it, by which time it was clear that QE wasn't going to be reversed, unwound anytime soon, was there should have been an increase in minimum margin requirements and collateral pair cut requirements in, in derivative markets, in repo and securities lending markets by the clearinghouses. And these were powers, they're actually powers that the UK authorities have, but uh, more broadly than the UK, these were powers um, that were identified as necessary after the last crisis on which the Financial Stability Board has, perhaps in slow motion, um, um, articulated how they should be used. And they weren't used, and they, were, and they should have been used. There should just simply be less, less leverage in lots of these other parts of, of finance. And as monetary policy normalizes, and more than normalizes because of the, um, of the stagflationary shock and the shock to um, monetary um, credibility, it actually becomes important for their, if I were the authorities, I think they should be trying to engineer quietly and as invisibly as possible, as much deleveraging in parts of finance as they can without making things worse. They've left it too late to begin on both sides of the Atlantic. So I'm not particularly talking about the UK, um, but that is no reason for saying, well, so we've left it this late, so we'll, let's carry on doing nothing. That's a, that's a gamble that the gods favor one. And, you know, the gods prefer to amuse themselves. And in terms of, you didn't talk too much about the spillovers to other countries. Can you perhaps allude to, that was well, one of the questions you raised, uh, how will it spill over across? Also, I, I'm not close enough to the action to know what the detailed mechanics would be. I think that this isn't quite a spillover, but I think that what we have been told um, by the LDI thing is that there are non-bank financial institutions out there, including supposedly long-term institutions, um, but no doubt credit funds as, as well, and partly ETFs and others, some ETFs, not all, um, that are levered, are illiquid, and as monetary policy tightens, there will be jolts. And, and this is avoidable, and it is what the reforms were meant to, part of what they were meant to avoid. So I think it's not so much that I think the UK's um, problems of the last weeks and perhaps over the next few weeks, who knows, um, will, will um, directly hit um, other centres. I'm not saying they won't. I don't know. I haven't got the information to judge that. But I do think it is, it is, it is more than a, a rapidly flashing amber light. This is saying... Um, oh my goodness, all those people that have been worrying about shadow banking and things like shadow banking over the past few years, they were not fantasists. Um, and, and yes, it is harder to get people to deleverage quietly when people, after people have become concerned about leverage, but that is not an argument for doing um, nothing. So can I come back again to financial dominance to this concept, uh, which I think is very, very important. Um, would there are two ways forward. There could be one way forward to say, okay, we have to be more gradual in tightening. So we can't tighten so fast because, you know, we don't know what, George, what, will, what hiccups we will see in the financial markets. Or the alternative way is so we, we can actually speedily tighten, but we have to have extra safeguards in place, like what you mentioned, the market maker of last resort. So occasionally, we have to probably help out for a week or two. Uh, do I read you correctly that you're for the second approach, so you wouldn't slow down any tightening cycle, uh, just because there might be hiccups in the financial markets? Well, in a, in a sense, I mean, as you've put it, yes. But of course, the the it's not ever how one frames the question as a policymaker, because you ask, what's the transmission going to be if I do something? And if, if my doing something is going to um, pretty immediately um, trigger a tightening in credit um, conditions, then that is something that you would need to weigh in deciding what to do. But, but the, the, the broader um, point that you make 
I, I think that the thing that you're worried about is fiscal dominance versus monetary dominance. In some respects, I think it operates at a higher political economy level than just framing it in terms of near-term or medium-term policy choices. I think part of what has happened um, in the advanced economy world, partly after the last crisis, is, is it's two things. One is a, one is a, um, a necessary condition for where we find ourselves, and the other is a um, perhaps even a sufficient condition. The, the, the necessary condition is, is a kind of feeling, I think, among the political world that th this price stability stuff, it's, it's, it's all done, you know, actually. It's, it, we've licked that. It's that's yesterday's problem. This is the problem of the 1970s, 1980s. We don't want to be focusing up uh, overly much on, 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 on that. I'll, I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, and then secondly, because in the response to 2008, Federal Reserve, um, European Central Bank, the Bank of England and others did lots of things with lots of facilities that generated the, this um, sense, very powerful sense of the United States and the UK of, oh, look, the central bank can do other things. They can, they can help steer credit. They can actually make the world a better place. You put those two things together, which is, well, we've licked the inflation problem and we can use the central bank to make the, the, the world a better place in all sorts of ways. You can see this absolutely running through speeches of Federal Reserve officials, regional presidents and governors in the run up to the deflationary shock. So this was not something just in the political community, this was something in the central banking community. But of course, the necessary condition is never met. Milton Friedman famously said, I'm gonna get the um, words slightly wrong, I suspect. Um, inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. That's only the symptom. Inflation is always and everywhere a political economy phenomenon. And the political economy drive um, to permit inflation, to take one's eye off the ball and use central banks for other things or whatever, um, that is ever with us. And the whole point of independent central banks is to have these people whose professional esteem and public prestige relies, depends not on helping social justice or climate change, even though those may be more important things, but on, but on doing the thing that only they can do, ensuring price stability and stability in the private part of the monetary system. And what the central banks are currently doing is they're trying to recover that and it becomes harder when they hesitated. So let, let's, uh, we have to come to a conclusion. We're running already over time, but I would like to end at a positive note. So if you look into the future, where do you see the, the glimpse of hope? Of course, we have a lot of challenges, you know, with the war in Ukraine, COVID is still stifling the economy and many, many hiccups everywhere. The, Can you give us a positive note and say, okay, some, uh, some positive outlook? Let me say something big, which isn't especially positive and then end on something positive. The okay. big thing is, and this actually is the the core theme of, of global discord out in a couple of weeks is that everything we've talked about, everything we've talked about has to be seen in the context of geopolitics. All the monetary regimes and, and financial stability regimes that some of us have been involved with and more of us have been involved in debating for a generation and a half have, have occurred under the umbrella of the Pax Americana. Um, and, and the world order is at stake, and that raises the stakes in all of this, that the West cannot afford another financial crisis of any serious magnitude whatsoever, and it should have been much more cautious about that. Here's the optimistic note, and I'm being serious. It's that the having let domestically, generation, domestically generated inflation get a little bit out of control and then be in denial about it. And having had this, um, this kind of shadow banking like problem in London, um, policymakers in, in the authorities 
have got a clear amber warning and a catalyst for, for refinding themselves in, in a way before, the, before things have fallen apart. And actually, I, I, in, in a sad way, I think that's something to be thankful for, that, that in the run-up to 2007, the problems in 1998 and the problems in late 2002 weren't taken seriously enough. So incumbent policymakers now have another opportunity. And I think that's something to be tremendously op um, um, optimistic about. Something has go gone wrong without being fatal. The UK is not facing a sovereign debt crisis. It is facing um, a need to, for greater vigilance. And it's just got a signal that that's where it will be headed. Thanks a lot, Paul. It's always good to draw some lessons and look at the data in detail. And we will meet again uh, talking about your new book, which is, of course, about geopolitics at the global scale, uh, global discord. I'm looking forward to that. And it's coming out, I think, in a few weeks, uh, early November. On November the 8th. November the 8th. So we will talk about uh, this uh, slightly different topic, but it's, of course, all connected. Geopolitics is everywhere these days. And I sign on to your positive outlook uh, that actually sometimes having small crises like this one might be helpful to be more resilient because you learn from the smallest and makes you more vigilant and you bounce back more easily if you face a more serious crisis down the road. Thanks a lot to all of you for staying to the end and uh, hope to see you soon again and see you soon again, Paul, as well. Thanks to everyone for watching. Thanks, Marcus. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.